Hello everyone, today we talk about the German ministerialis, and more in particular of their mortality, the consequences in the inheritance system, in which the female line uh, counted a lot, as we will see, as essentially extended parental groups, and the subsequent um, in fact, uh, family and uh, asset partitions that derive from it. As you know, I began since last year at least to talk more in depth about the ministerialis, so the German servant knights, right? Uh, this is the national peculiarity of what would become, in fact, the most common type of knight uh, in Germany. Uh, by the 13th century, however, having reached uh, factually a, a power that was equal, if not sometimes even superior, than one of uh, the free uh, nobility. Uh, and we will keep talking about this more in general. Today we just look at this specific aspects. The ministerialis, um, and especially, you know, in the 14th century, they really disappear, right? Their um, juridical divide is evidently not um, a real one anymore, and so the distinction dies out. Uh, and the ministerialis are particularly connected with the destiny of the German national monarchy. So, until this w existed factually in a in a functional way, with a state, let's say that in spite of the elective system and all the difficulties existing um, in uh, in in the country, um, was functional to monarchic and imperial policy. Right, most of, for example, the Italian expeditions were carried out uh, by these um, uh, ministerialists, especially the ones of the German princ uh, principalities, um, excuse me, ecclesiastical principalities that were, in fact, the most loyal to the crown until the 13th century at least. Uh, and today we talk specifically about the 13th century, right? And by the way, and as a consequence, the ministerialists were really the, the iron fist of the German monarchy. They were the ones that made uh, imperial authority respected, that uh, dispensed of you know, the, the problems and, and of the political uh, enemies um, in the country, uh, but were also, in fact, uh, filing rank uh, knights. Uh, they composed, in fact, the bulk of uh, the, the German armies, especially the, the southern ones, up to 90%, uh, even in places like Swabia and Austria, that were also, by the way, the richest parts uh, in Germany. Um, and thus, their lifestyle was extremely brutal, to say the least, uh, and naturally mortality was uh, a thing, right, during all the expeditions, um, illness, that's right, these people had a very dangerous job for which they were rewarded, however. And so, um, as we are saying, by especially the later period, they also began to manage very large amounts of land. Naturally, as servants, this was their function. They were, in theory, just administrators of lords that possessed fully their uh, their their assets, and so that they just subcontracted, or better, they entrusted Right, because the the ministerialists didn't have such a, a true free. Uh, it wasn't free, right? So it didn't have a free juridical capacity. They always required some sort of blessing by their by their lords, by the emperor, even at some point. Um, however, as we were just saying, their wealth, generally speaking, would approximate them in ever more in in practice to the free knights. Also, as far as these inheritance issues were concerned, and um, the ministerialists were quite mobile, they were purchased also by the various uh, noblemen, they were sometimes resettled, but they worked better, let's say, if rooted in a certain context, where again, the interior they didn't have any right of succession, but they could administer locally, and also thus partitioning their own um, their own tasks, as they had been, uh, as if they were proper inheritance, uh, as they had been entrusted to them by their lords, and their lords were kind of fine with that, because after all, that's how all knighthood worked in, in Europe, so they, they weren't doing anything dysfunctional or useless at, at all, as long as they retained, naturally, uh, they, they remained faithful to their lords, which, generally speaking, was, was the case. Um, that mortality was very high, right, and uh, summed with the mobility this produced, especially within their milieu, a necessity to create some sort of 
you know, extended parental groups that could inherit through female line as well, importantly enough, um, and thus rendering easier the process of, um, let's say, preservation of compact assets in certain given areas. And there was a lot of also provincialism in this regard. I mean, they, um, as they were entrenched in, in their in a certain area, the ministerialists wanted to preserve their own their own status there, so not being very open to, say, foreigners, people to f from inventors coming from other areas. Um, and uh, there were many reasons for this that naturally are part of the broader political context of the various lands that we discuss here and there. But just to make an example from Thuringia regarding to the mortality, and we made a video about medieval Thuringia, a uh, couple of months ago, when you read the Erfurt Chronicler um, for the year 1285, you notice that it was a very high, uh, as a matter of fact, an exceptional even, mortality amongst the Thuringian ministerialists. Consider that all, out of roughly 70 families of ministerialists in Fiat in the second quarter of the 12th century by the Bishop Gebhard of Eichstätt, and his brother, the Count um, Hartwig of Grögling, only 40 had survived by about the 20s of the 13th century. And at the end of the same century, only 30 in total were left. So more than half of these ministerialist family had literally died out. Um, and for, for all causes, but as you understand, because they were in the military. Uh, we know only in some cases for certain, because of course the documentation is not uh, dramatic, that the ministerialis uh, patrimony is passed by female inheritance to other knightly families. Right? Ministerialis could also make deals with, with the free knights um, as long as what, because they also accumulated. Uh, uh, some, you know, some personal wealth, right? So they could naturally intertwine that in, in the mechanism. But generally speaking, it was mostly what they received as servants that was uh, meaningful. Um, and therefore, uh, this, um, this female connection, this female I inheritance, was aimed, of course, at maintaining a, a more direct connection with the say, immediate uh, milieu that had, um, in fact, been forming mostly on a provincial base. In other words, they wanted to maintain their own assets concentrated also locally. This could happen, uh, especially as uh, the ministerialists on average were less um, rich than the free nobility. So, as a consequence, their... Uh, say range of action also politically speaking was shorter than the average this this is reflected also um, uh, by in, in the certification of the same ministerialis in fact they were as we'll see now very powerful ones who um, were uh, let's say also marrying to other ministerialis from from different from different lands in in, in the same Germany um, so at a higher level, on a larger geographical scale, whereas others tended to remain more uh, local. Uh, and it was a way, of course, to preserve power locally, to, to increase their own status, because they would de facto become, in many cases, the, the real landlords in many areas. Uh, in the later 13th century, the ministerialis of Ilpolstein, of Stetten Gaia, Kopf of Flüglingen and Sulzburg Wolfstein intermarried as much as seven times within two generations, right? Uh, so within their groups. Wu, by the way, by female inheritance, had already uh, now in incorporated the patrimonies of Breitenstein, Heimburg, and Kipfenberg uh, with other three, um, to rather three marriages, right? So this tells you how concrete and practical such ties really were, how important the female 
uh, inheritance um, really was. And that's also how much uh, wealth, these were important assets, could be included in, the, in a ministerialis family. And consider that the ones that we listed now were not particularly distinguished. Um, there were their neighbors, for example, were instead the, the imperial marshals of Pappenheim uh, and the ministerialis of Königstein, who are the aforementioned type that married uh, further afield um, in Swabia, in Franconia, um, with, uh, with other families of imperial household officers that were ministerialis, and that's how important they really were in the empire. Uh, we're talking about, for example, the butlers of Schupp Klingenbach and the chamberlains of Munzenbach. So, as long as good, uh, you know, wives, uh, heiresses specifically, could be found, um, as a consequence, male primogeniture, or even the descent of family possessions in the male line, was not so important, actually, among the ministerialis families. And th this is really interesting. Because you understand, this, this is kind of more of a clanic structure than kind of a, um, a lineage one. Of course, th the latter still existed. There was a lot of kind of feudal practices kicking in, especially by the 13th century. And so male primogeniture was becoming important. But um, aside from a few times where properly the right of eldest sons to thieves and offices was made explicit in, um, in these agreements, in these contracts, in uh, testaments, etc. But even in the marriages, uh, it was still exceptional. It was, for example, the case of the military thieves held from the Sea of Cologne for the thieves of uh, uh, the Ha Castle and for the household offices of Benedict Boyan Abbey and the Sea of Salzburg. So, you understand the important patrimonies. Naturally, you have to realize that not all these assets were connected to the military performance, but it didn't matter because these were broader landowners, right? And so they, they played with these assets as, as these practices allowed them uh, to do. Uh, we know also that among the Tecklenburg Ministerialis, the family castle would pass to the youngest son. Um, the, the point is also that this, however, general, say, greater attention for the other son's inheritance and the, also the female inheritance in the case of the Ministerialis is part of a broader German characteristic as the country was not fully feudalized until the mid 12th century and also it's the 13th that really sees the, the full affirmation of practices but uh, until early modern times you really see that Germany has a different wealth distribution some areas are just um, uh, less uh, they have less surplus so in practice uh, it was easier for the various sons to still claim their own part of the narrative. I mean, this is the entire thing that started since the time of the Franks and and all the other peoples that, you know, as the Romans and the Germans considered, uh, uh, of course, an equal repartition among the sons, the normal inheritance mechanism. Uh, and so uh, this was essentially a limit in part because it would allow less state building on the long run and that's the same reason why at the end of the day the monarchy disgregated in a national sense but the at, at the same time uh, they they also reflected the necessity in fact of, uh, of such practice remaining in force because had you know just the, the firstborn son or the eldest son monopolized the uh, you know, the inheritance, uh, the other, he would have not been s so powerful enough to, to counter the the demands of the other, um, of the other heirs in general, because by the way, there weren't, har there were hardly just only the, the brothers there, it was always a mess, because there's a, 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 you know, a feudal force, literally, of incredibly intertwined interests with everybody involved. We already made videos about the Ministerial, so I explained the all the nuisances. I mean, 
for example, the contempt from the side of the free nobility against them, so that they treated them as kind of s still set, even, even though, you know, they they were sometimes protected by, and, and exactly because of that by the empire, that the, the nobility didn't accept this because they were considered lesser, um, lesser people. In fact, they were just serpents, right? So, in, in their view, that this this was um, in in the free nobility view, this was a, kind of a challenge to their, to their power, given that the ministerialists, as we were saying before, were also quite, you know, effectively violent. Um, and they knew how to defend their own prerogatives. Um, so, uh, primogeniture was never uh, recommended itself uh, in Germany as a preponderant legal principle. And this is valid in Germany for also the medieval landed families, whether territorial magnates, free lords, uh, or in fact knightly ministerialists, who were more inclined to distribute more equally their, their processions among uh, and titles uh, to, to, to the various sons. Uh, in the 13th century, the imperial butlers of Schupf founded new and separate lordships at Limburg, Klingenberg and Neukasten. Um and so did their imperial advocates of Weide at Gera, Plauen and Kreis. Um This naturally reflects what we just said. It means that uh, even within the ministerialist families there were um, different knights doing different things. And so uh, even though, as we've seen, there was a, a clanic compaction, still there was an autonomy um, that allowed different heirs to invest uh, differently and uh, thus creating different centers of power that could be also in competition with, with one another. Uh, the imperial seneschal in, in uh, Saxony, Gunzelin of Wolfenbüttel, whose chief residence was his Ildesheim fief of Peine castle, built new castles for his sons grandsons at Asseburg, Stauffenburg and Heiningen and their descendants in fact would build or inherit or in, were in theft with yet more castles endowed with appurtenances at Hindenburg, Morgengen, Salza and Lechede. This shows fundamentally that the ministerialists pursued the same exact patrimonial uh, objectives of the free knights and even monarchs, the same emperor. That's what essentially had made every single German dynasty rise into power. Otto I had owed his empire to his father Henry de Flavler's uh, encastellation in Saxon. Much can be said also for the Franconians. Um, Frederick Barbarossa owed his imperial crown, among other things, but the deep uh, encastellation in Swabia that his father carried out after he was blind and thus had become physically unfit for competing uh, to, to the monarchy. Um, and Frederick II, his uh, grandson at this point was, in the 13th century, was even practically selling um, uh, public uh, rights to private um, noblemen in order to cash and uh, build more castles in in Swabia and southern Germany also trying to essentially incorporate through this inheritance mechanisms for example great uh, thieves um, l great seniors like the one of the Babenberg in, in Austria and and so the ministerialists while playing again a smaller scale game but still contributed dramatically to the development of the so-called princely Germany as they were practically privatizing in their own way and increasing ever more power, the 13th century was still a moment essentially of growth uh, of Europe till the end and especially in countries like Germany this was quite um, staunch. Um, thus in the naturally institutional difficulties of, of the monarchy uh, contributing also to, to create other bases of power that in the, f in the following centuries would have been uh, in fact uh, useful for, for private dynasties to rise to power through that in fact uh, familial background. Um, 
but this is incredibly important. The affluent imperial seneschals uh, in the Rhineland, the, the most uh, developed areas in Germany, essentially the west and the south, made comparable divisions of their possessions into, uh, for example, the lordships of Bolanden, Falkenstein, and Hohenfels um, in the early 13th century. Uh, later on, Philip of Falkenstein um, and his sons showed that subdivision could safely be made, right? uh, and especially on the strength of the lavish inheritance brought in by Philip's wife, Isengard of Münzenberg, uh, consider that Philip was already rich on his own, but his marriage with Isengard really secured the future of his line as significant territorial lords. Um, and as we've seen before, uh, the imperial ministerialis of Münzenberg, so being an imperial ministerialis, not just a, a random uh, nobleman guy who was, was quite a... Uh, quite an advantage in many ways, uh, had been founded on um, this uh, combination of patrimonies um, in Armsburg, Bilstein, and Hagen, um, and um, it was fueled further, actually, with fresh imperial land grants during the 12th century, because this was the way for, for the emperors to boost quite loyal supporters and which better supporter is the one that is not free but bound to you and that's the logic of the ministerialis in an area like Germany to strengthen their power landed power further so what happened in the 13th century was that Kuno of Hagen that had built the Münzenberg castle as his principal residence and aggrandized his power um, was um, um, was to see his line resolved into heiresses. And that's where Philip of Falkenstein and Isengard of Münzenberg, um, now becoming Falkensteins, secured the lion's share. Right? The female connection, fundamental. Uh, Philip was confirmed, in fact, in what in Kuna, that is his father in law's office of imperial chamberlain as well in the process with its extensive fiefs connected to it and also in the lordship of Königstein which was a fief from the counts of Nassau so you see the double the ministerialis opus and from an imperial and also another uh, it's that free noble side in this process, Philip was also able to exclude or buy out the claims of more distant heirs that existed, that always had something to complain about. Because, uh, again, I can't stress enough the incredible complication of these connections. I'm making it very, very simple, but it was plenty of different heirs from also actually very far away places geographically. Um, for example, you know, there were the, the imperial marshals of Pappenheim, the ministerialis of Weinsberg and Schoenberg. Um, this marriage with Isengard really brought the full confirmation, let's say, on, on, at least on the longer run, of uh, Philip's rights. Right? Again, via female line. Right, so a fair proportion, however, passed still to um, to other heiresses in in, in this mechanism. Uh, for example, Adelheid of Münzenberg, who married a free lord. This is also interesting. Reinhard of Hanau, who thus could cash as a as a nobleman, simply you know also the uh, this this properties from a ministerialis vein, right? This tells you how really the lot, how important the latter really were. Um, yet Philip still got the better of them as well after long uh, quarrels, selling the truth, and even occupying uh, militarily all the principal castles of the former, it was known as the former dominion of Münzenberg, that is 
Assenheim-Hagen, that is today's Dreieckenhain, and Münzenberg itself. So this tells you also why the mortality was high in the process, because naturally it was other wars. Again, these people lived, especially a country like Germany had a high um, word likeness, you know, that the um, it was, first of all, a, a frontierless country, especially in the East. So uh, this had maintained uh, the, the Germans more in contact with this idea of, I don't know, in this century there are the Mongols, there are various raids of the Kumans and things like that. Um, so the aptness to war is kind of, from an individual point of view, kind of greater. This mercenaries, uh, this, this knights eventually, uh, the, the ministerialis family is declining during the time of princely Germany would sell their services abroad, famously not, um, and putting their military skills, at, you know, to, to very good use. Like uh, in, the in the Italian uh, signories, for example, they, they were basically the bulk of the local armies. At some point, they literally took over Scandinavia at a point um, as essentially controllers of the uh, more the weaker Scandinavian uh, institutional systems. Um, so there is always a, a history of that, and it, it derives from this continuous meat grinder that, as we've seen, could wipe out the majority of ministerialist families in a, in a certain era, like Thuringia, uh, in essentially not even a couple hundred hundred years. And we're talking about the families, by the way, so not just, again, individual lines. And this is the point we were making. So this means that the mortality was very high, literally among the everyone, the, the brothers. Um, and this, this makes you think, really. Um, Consider that as serfs, they also couldn't be else. Like, this was not like for the free nobility that they could become, I don't know, Mm, clergy or something like that. Th these were all involved in, in the military affair. Mm. So Philip of Falkenstein um, um, securing such enormous assets decided in 1263 to divide them um, between their his sons, Philip and Werner, um, and although the details were changed um, several times in the following years, shows the importance of these mechanisms and the nuisances that they entailed, uh, this shows what was pretty much the regular practice in the, in, in the process. Um, in time, the younger Philip's chief residents were Falkenstein, the imperial castles of Trifels and of um, Anibus and Kaub, which he converted into a thief from the Count's Palatine of the Rhine in 1277. Um, this, this is relevant because you realize we are at the end of the 13th century. It's a very tumultuous moment. This is... Um, you know, at the time of, of the wars of Rudolf of Habsburg with Bohemia, exactly the year in which basically Germany's, uh, Germany abandons the Habsburg after he had already secured Austria um, and was left on his own against Bohemia. Uh, and especially in this other, in the Rhineland, where the, also the Habsburg would make a lot of effort to reconquer castles and so on. There was, you, you can see this gradual. Um, in fact, transformation of the ministerialis, uh, like in this sense, you see, in an intergenerational sense, the Philip Falkenstein makes this fully ministerialis marriage, and uh, eventually his son here from the Count Palatine of the Rhine even manages to, to turn one, one, one fifth into uh, one, one of these patrimonies in, into a, a, a normal fief, not a, a ministerialis one. Uh, Werner, his brother instead, resided in Munzenberg, Assenheim. They toured, naturally, it was normal, they had the court itinerating. And the imperial castles of Karlsmund and Nürings, 
uh, also settling up a division for his share for the benefit of his three children in 1294. You understand these children all get their own share as, as, as ministeriales, as we were saying before. His inheritance was made up specifically of the four chief castles or domus, the house, of the Münzenbergs that were the aforementioned Hagen, Assenheim and Münzenberg herself, which were allowed, interestingly enough, so were at this point conceived properly to be in some sort of full property. Although the manors appurtenant were still imperial fiefs, right? And as such, uh, for example, the Königstein was uh, a fief of Nassau, as we were saying before. So you see very interestingly the, the idea, you know, the, at this point we are, even after the Great Interregnum, the imperial authority is, is liquefying. The Habsburgs, yes, rise between the end of the 13th, the, the beginning of the 14th century, some power, but eventually the, the, the matter is settled with the Luxembourgs, the the uh, the Vitas, Bax and the Habsburg and other, uh, the Vet and the, the Oenzollern, etc. Um, and in the uh, in the process, what was the meaning of the fact that these possessions were de facto public property because they were imperial assets held in allot? So what the hell does it mean? And these were originally just servants. It means that by the end of the 13th century, they had become essentially landlords like all the others, right? And that was hardly anyone there deciding much. Of course, the imperial authority in part still functioned. There were rules were still played by by the various princes, by the by the by the king of the Romans, by the emperor that was reelected after the even not dramatically long parentheses of the interregnum, but that had, with the, with the latter still fundamentally undermining this broader order that the monarchy had tried in terms of public uh, administration to, to keep alive. At this point, it was just properly, um, just private power that was making the thing. Um, and speaking of the original Falkenstein patrimony, uh, this was also subdivided, um, for example, with the Bolandan inheritance passing down to the elder line. And the uh, matrilinear acquisition, uh, that is Münzenberg with its uh, previous hagen Armsburg bases, um, somewhat uh, depleted uh, by the dynasty of the free dynasty by the way of Hanau that passed to the younger son. So this is um, this is interesting because it shows also how um, the you know there the were, the were uh, new new markets that were opening, new opportunities, new new mechanics that were opening at, at this point that as as we were saying were quite different from from the previous ones. And so that. Um, um, that distinction between the, the ministerialis and the free knights were fundamentally uh, dying out. Uh, but this is quite interesting because it shows you how really everybody was doing their best to survive in this mess that was also a pretty bloody one, as you noticed. And in general, how in times before the contemporary era in general, um, the, um, the real power was measured on a local basis. The same ministerialis had been born uh, with, uh, actually not probably born with that function because they have a very long story, but they had acquired that, right, of landlords, uh, unavoidably, at, uh, uh, especially because of the massive uh, assets that the emperors endowed them with, right? And once given, like it was not dramatically different from the the other um, free uh, the, the relation between the the emperor and the, the the other free vassals. Well, you could hardly think you could get them back, especially if 
these people were so loyal that it would have been, you know, counterproductive, actually harmful to try to get them back because it's on that base that you really had their own loyalty uh, and uh, aside from their their servitude which could not be autonomously changed if not again in, in the absence of rules so when the princely phase kicks in and so Germany is starting to be built actually with the in fact the the, the creation of some local states that as you know that wouldn't make it to reunify the country until the 19th century but that um, still were functional locally right and fit in this broader phase of say crisis post crisis of late medieval Europe that as we've seen also in these in the various um, historical region series is, is a bit the same all over Europe right there's this great growth and uh, we witness here during up to the 13th century and with the apex in, in the same of uh, important private uh, and real power real assets consolidation uh, and then a crisis uh, in the following century that contracts everything especially from a demographic and economic point of view and so with a sort of re-entrenchment and re of the system in the process of you know given that in high medieval times there had been some statal achievement that was not reached at this point um, if not on a much more private base that however is also how the original state in high medieval times had been created so you see there are different cycles at the same time and these are just little you know examples there are lots of other ministerialists we can see them uh, at other point however for today I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise do a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye